So since we have our derivatives test coming up Monday now, uh, I figured we could go through some of the problems plus in the back of this chapter two, the derivatives chapter of Stuart. And that would, if you're at the point where you're, you want to attack those yourselves, by all means try them first, but I'll be talking about the methodical way to go about solving them. And if you're at the point where you can understand these pretty well, then you're going to do fine on the test, I guarantee. So not, and you'll notice chapter two, uh, we, in our first unit on derivatives, we only went through the chain rule, which is 2.5, but the chapter goes through 2.9, which is something, I don't remember. Uh, so obviously we won't be doing all the problems plus, and there are too many anyway, but we'll do like five or 10, so we'll see. Okay, here's problem one. We're given the function y equals one minus x squared. We have it here, and we need to find the coordinates of the two points P, Q, such that the tangent lines at P, Q form an equilateral triangle with where they intersect the Y axis. So we haven't actually talked about ways to approach these types of problems, but a good strategy to see right off the bat is P and Q are gonna have the same y value and they'll just have the negative x value so we can just focus on q for example and then just flip the x value for p. So what do we know about equilateral triangles? We know that if we complete it like this we know that that angle will be 60 degrees and what do we know about 60 degrees if we draw a little triangle over here say this is x, we know this is 2x, and we know this is x root 3. So what we can say about the slope of this tangent line is m is equal to delta y over delta x, which is x root 3 over x, which is just root 3. So we now know, or technically it's negative, yeah, it's negative. Okay, so we know the slope, and we have a function, so we can take the derivative and then we can find the point at which the slope is equal to negative root 3. So dy dx is equal to, constant cancels out, we get negative 2x. Now we need to set that equal to negative root 3, and we get x is equal to root 3 over 2. And like I said, we can flip that over onto p, so this is going to be negative root 3 over 2, and if we plug this point back into y, y equals 1 minus root 3 over 2 squared equals 1 minus 3 fourths equals 1 fourth. So we have our two points. We have p at negative root 3 over 2, and the y value is 1 fourth. And q is positive root 3 over 2 comma 1 fourth. So there's the answer to 1. Okay, number 2, we have these two functions. We need to find the point or points at which they have the same tangent line, which means they'll touch each other and they'll be tangent to each other. So an example would be right here. These two curves would have the same tangent line like that. So what do we have to find? Well, we know that they'll have to be, the function will be equal at a certain x, and they will have the same derivative at that same x. So if we take the two derivatives, we have dy over dx equals 3x squared minus 3, and this one is dy over dx equals 6x minus 3. So we need these to be equal and these to be equal. So we create two systems, uh, x cubed minus 3x plus 4 is equal to 3x squared minus 3x. And over here, 3x squared is equal to 6x. We can just get rid of the minus 3 because it's the same on both sides. And this one's clearly easier to solve, so we can find all the solutions applicable here and test those over here instead of trying to solve this cubic, which is more annoying. 
So we could see we can we can divide by three. So we just get x squared equals two x, and the two obvious solutions here are x equals zero or two. So if we plug these in over here, we can see immediately that zero does not work because over here you get four, over here you get zero. But if we try two, we get eight minus six plus four is equal to 12 minus six. And this is 12 minus six, 12 minus six, so six equals six. And that works, which means our x value is gonna be two. Now, what is the y value? We can just plug it into one of these. I would probably plug it into the second one because it looks a little simpler. So we have the point two comma y at x equals two is equal to three times two squared minus three times two is equal to 12 minus six is equal to six. And I realized we did that over here, so that was pointless. And if you can check that just by graphing on your calculator, you'll see their tangent at that point. Okay, so for problem number three, we're given the basic form of a quadratic function, and we're given the x values p and q, and we're trying to prove that the tangent lines to our parabola at the x values p and q intersect at an x value equidistant from p and q, so p plus q over 2 is the average. So what we need to do first is actually find these tangent lines. Uh, so if we look at the derivative, dy over dx is equal to 2ax plus b. So if we want to write, say, p of x as the tangent line at p, and q of x as the tangent line at q, what we actually want to do is write it in a form of point slope form, which is just a little bit easier, uh, but we're gonna sort of skip a step and immediately move, because generally you'd have it in the form y minus uh, y sub one or whatever your given y is equal to m times x minus x sub one, but we're gonna move up with the y sub one immediately. So p of x is equal to the slope, which is two a p plus b, two a p plus b, times x minus p plus p plugged into the original equation, which is a p squared plus b p plus c. So this one will be the same idea. 2a q plus b x minus q plus a q squared plus b q plus c. Okay, so now we need to find the intersection of these two. And we can do that by setting them equal to each other. Uh, so p of x equals q of x. And let's see, do we want to simplify first? It might be better just to factor this out immediately, just so we see our terms more clearly. And we can do that as we end it up. So what we can do is cancel out the c's immediately because since they're setting them equal to each other, they'll you can just subtract it out anyway. So if we factor or expand this, sorry. So we have two a x p plus b x minus two a p squared minus b p plus a p squared plus b p. We can already see it's starting to cancel stuff out. That cancels out. This becomes a negative one minus is equal to equal to two a q x plus b x minus two a q squared minus b q plus a q squared plus b q. Those cancel out. This becomes a one. So we are left with. 2axp plus bx minus ap squared is equal to 2aqx plus bx minus aq squared. And another thing is the bx's cancel out. 
And so now we need to solve for x, and we can just do that by just put, putting everything over on this side. So we have 2axp minus 2axq is equal to ap squared minus aq squared. So we can factor out the x, x. We can actually factor out 2ax, but we'll leave it right here. P minus Q is equal to A, and we're going to do a little trick here. Remember, the difference of squares is equal to P plus Q, P minus Q. And we can safely cancel these out by dividing on both sides by P minus Q because uh, the only instance where P minus Q would be zero if P is equal to Q, and if P is equal to Q, then it's the same tangent line, so we don't have to worry about that case. So then we get x, and also notice a's cancel out. So x is equal to p plus q over 2. So there you go. The x value is exactly halfway between p and q, so we have proved the statement. So number 5, and by the way, we're skipping forward because it's pretty much all simplification. There's a teeny bit of calculus, but it's kind of annoying. It's not really worth it. Since, especially since we also by Mr. May's class while in the AP test. So number five, we have this function is equal to the limit as t approaches x of secant t minus uh, secant x all over t minus x. So we have to find f prime of pi over four. So the important thing to notice pretty much immediately is that this is the form of a derivative. It doesn't look like it because there's no delta x or h or whatever you want to say, but if we say let t equal x plus h, then as t approaches x, that will mean that h approaches 0. Because since there's no harm in really plugging it in right now, if you let h be equal to 0, then t is equal to x. So we can just substitute this in, and we get limit as h approaches 0 of secant x plus h minus secant plus x x all over h and that's just the derivative of secant which is secant tangent so then we can find the derivative of that using product rule which will give us the derivative of secant times tangent plus derivatives of tangent times secant, derivative of secant, as we just did, we get secant x tangent x times another tangent x plus secant x times secant squared x. And we don't have to simplify this out, we just need to plug in pi over 4. And secant is the same as 1 over cosine, and cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. It's technically 1 over root 2, so we can just say root 2. So here we have root 2, and the tangent of pi over 4 is clearly 1, so we can just say root 2, plus root 2 cubed, which is 2 root 2, which is equal to 3 root 2. So there we go. All right, six looks a lot like something we might have as a bonus on the test, so I figured it'd be good to do that as well. So the way I would do this, which is a little far-fetched, and I'm sure there are many ways to do it, and including ways we haven't even learned yet, but you can imagine, like, if we replace x with h, which doesn't do anything, it just lets us think of it in a different way. then this almost look like, looks like the derivative of some cube root function at some value, right? Because, say, the cube root of uh, something is equal to 2. We, so basically we can immediately say, or let me back up. So the reason this is not some cube root value is because at the specific point that we're calculating, the cube root happens, the stuff inside the cube root happens to be 8. So this will or negative 8, I guess. No, it's positive 8, so this will end up being 2. But 
we're plugging in h, which is where we get our limit. So we know if we let f of something, say c, is equal to, or we can say f prime of c, which then we can work backwards by saying that essentially b will have to be equal to a, right? Because if this is a formal derivative, then as h approaches 0, we get the 0 for 0 situation, which means that square root of b has to be equal to, or the cube root of b has to be equal to 2. So we can immediately see b is equal to 8. So we can rewrite this as limit as h approaches 0 of cube root of a h plus 8 minus 2 over h equals 5 false. So this gets where it gets a little bit interesting since we're assuming this is a derivative and we want to find uh, some value f of x so it's a bit more explicit to find uh, 5 twelfths and hence find a we can rewrite this part as the cube root. So we know there's going to be an x plus h term because in a derivative you don't plug in h into f, you plug in x plus h. So we can say, uh, how do we do this? So we have an x plus h term and we know we're going to have to multiply. And we can go ahead and plug in c actually. Right, so we have uh, times a, because we know that we have an ah here, it will look like that, which also means that a times c is equal to 8, so it's good to know, and which makes sense, because if we don't have an h at all, then when we plug in uh, a times, just a times c, we get r2. So we know that a times c is equal to 8, so we can write the actual function as the cube root of AC. Cool. Or I guess AX. Right? So we have this, and we know that F prime of C is equal to 5 twelfths. So if we want to take the immediate derivative of F, F prime of X is equal to, well, we have. This is ax quantity to the one third power, so we bring out the one third. And it's now to the negative two thirds power, but because of chain rule, we multiply by a. Okay, and if we're plugging in our c value, uh, let's see, plug in c, f prime of c is equal to, we know this is going to be 8 and 1 third, 8 to the negative 2 thirds times a is equal to 5 over 12. So now a is our only unknown and we can find a. So 8 to the 2 thirds uh, power is uh, 2 squared, which is just 4, and the negative 2 thirds is 1 over 4, so we get 1 12th and actually becomes a over 12 is equal to 5 over 12 so a is equal to 5. So we have found a and b and if we want to try plugging it in say we actually let there be a function uh, cube root of 5x then we can write the formal derivative as f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of cube root of 5x plus h minus cube root of 5x over h. And the if we know that our constant terms here, if we multiply this out, we'll get 5x plus h in here, and we know that 5x has to be equal to 8 based on the b that we have, which implies 
that x is equal to some value that gives 5x is equal to 8, which means x is equal to 8 fifths. So x is equal to 8 fifths. So if we plug that into our original formula for f prime, which we saw up here is this, we can now plug in our 5. So 5 thirds times 5x to the negative 2 thirds. Plug in 8 fifths, we get 5 thirds f prime of 8 fifths equals 5 thirds times 8 to the negative 2 thirds. And we, all, we already established that this is 1 fourth, so we get 5 twelfths. So we found these terms, and when we plug them back in and we find our c term, we find that this actually works. All right, this will be the last problem that we'll do. So the problem is given this function, f of x equals x to the n over one minus x, find the nth derivative of x. So this is kind of a fun problem. And what I would do is just do a u sub immediately because generally in derivatives, you don't want something like this on the bottom because it'll make these quotient rule and quotient rules get ugly because you have to square it and things like that. So if we let u equals one minus x, this also means that x is equals one minus u. So if we plug all this back in here, f of u is equal to one minus u to the n over u. So now we can just use binomial theorem to expand this out into a bunch of different pretty easy to calculate uh, derivatives. No, not derivatives, uh, expressions, monomials, whatever. So if we want to write this as a sum, or we don't have to write it as a sum, we can just look at terms first. So we know this will expand out to 1 minus n times u uh, plus uh, n choose u. Wait. Yeah, n choose 2 uh, times u squared plus dot, 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 dot. So we have 1 over u minus n times u over u, which just cancels out, plus Next one would be n times n minus 1 of u squared over u, which just becomes u minus dot dot dot. And the last term we will have will be, uh, I guess it depends. Uh, well, if n is even or if n is odd, because if n is even, then we'll have a positive term, uh, u to the n minus 1. And if n is odd, we'll have a negative term, u to the n minus, yeah, it'll just be u to the n minus 1 still. Uh, so plus or minus u to the n minus 1. Because in the numerator, we'll get u to the n, the denominator will still have a u, so this will cancel out. But if we take the nth derivative of this, All of these will cancel out because, say, after the first derivative, this will this is a constant, so it becomes zero. After the second derivative, this will go from uh, a, a linear term to a constant to zero. And if we do the derivative n times, then even this will become zero because after n minus one derivatives, it'll become a constant because we'll reduce the exponent that many times, and then one more time will make it zero. So all this will just cancel out. So we're actually just left with the nth derivative of 1 over u. So if we want to investigate that, uh, say the first derivative of 1 over u is, we'll just write it like this problem is. Uh, we know it's u to the negative 1, so we'll end up with negative 1 over u squared. And next one is this times negative 2, and then decrease the exponent again, so we'll end up with 2 over u cubed. We'll have negative 6 over u to the fourth, and then we'll have 
24 over u to the fifth, dot, dot, dot. So what we can state is, so this would be the second derivative, and this is two factorial, because we'd be multiplying by increasing integers. Third derivative will be three factorial, dot, dot, dot. So we can write a general form as n factorial over u to the n plus 1. And there is a negative sign, uh, so we can just do that, because if you remember, after the first derivative was negative, second derivative was positive, dot, 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 so on even values of n, it will be uh, positive, because negative 1 to an even value is positive, and etc. So this is our actual term, but we have to plug back in the 1 minus x, which is pretty easy. So f to the nth derivative of u is equal to negative 1 to the nth times n factorial over 1 minus x to the n plus 1. That's our answer. Before we end the video, I wanted to mention that if you haven't yet, you should try out the SMMP, which is active till this coming Monday. If you're watching this before the Monday, if you're watching in the future, sucks for you, too bad. Uh, but it's due Monday. There are a lot of fun problems. You may not be able to do them all, which is okay. Uh, but there are different diverse problems. There are interesting problems that'll make you think in different ways. You'll get to apply things that you have learned and you'll get to compete and you can do with your friends. And I will actually be making uh, solution videos for all the problems on SMMT and I'll release that after the deadline ends. So go enjoy this for the next few days and then see how well you did.